to, to kind of switch gears here, um, and, you know, take this for what it is, and, and I'll explain a little bit of my backstory with the space, but as it relates to quantum, yeah, couldn't agree more with you on a lot of the gate-based and annealing, you know, machine-based plays in the market today. Um, you know, I had first invested in, in quantum back in October of 24, no one was even talking about it. Kind of the run-up hadn't even started. Um, must have bought Rigetti like at about 25. Yeah, congrats. So, well, well I mean, <laughs> sold it at like 78 bucks and thought I was a genius. Thought, you know. I mean, you, right, that's a great, it's getting, it's a great win, it's man. Away. Yeah, but, um, you know, thought it was getting away from itself from evaluation, you know, actual technological progress standpoint. Um, and so kind of pivoted my attention to BTQ at that point in time, got really into the story and, and for background, I am a professional investor and PM at a family office. Um, you know, have, you know, spent the past year plus, you know, deep diving into the story, um, you know, actually traveling to, to their various subsidiaries in, in Australia and in Vancouver. Um, and so know the story fairly well. So I'm just a little perplexed at having joined a couple of your spaces um, and hearing you discuss what what you perceive and, and quite frankly what I perceive to be an actual law in Bitcoin. I'm not saying BTQ is purely a Bitcoin related proxy, um, but on on that notion itself, yeah. Uh, and correct me if I'm wrong. Like one of your large kind of counters or as you would put it, your, your kind of three sigma or six sigma kind of scenarios that would play out is the underlying code fractures. Um, so to that extent, I, I, I guess I'm just curious as to why BTQ would be kind of lumped in with the rest of the much higher CapEx-based models that or machine-based plays that you know, that fall into the, today's public sphere of quantum assets. Well, I'll pause there, but, but yeah. really just wanted to get your sure. kind of take and kind of have an honest dialogue here, because I do know the story probably better than 90, I'd venture to say 99% of people out there. Great, you probably know better than me then. Um, so, so just for some background for people who are listening, like, I've had this weird hobby. <laughs> uh, I had the unfortunate position of being thrown in jail uh, for making my investors 5 to 10x, but lying about it, according to the government. Um, a lot of investors, though, would not, uh, would not object, uh, even if you took the story at face value. But I, I was sitting in, in prison, and I sort of said, well, I have a unique opportunity here to learn things. And I forgot how much I like learning things. And I, I got some books, and I, I started to become like an amateur mathematician. I didn't get that far, by the way. Unfortunately, math is very, very hard. Um, and I respect these guys like a, a thousand X more than I used to. Um, and I'm a huge math fan, but like I got nothing on these dudes who, who do it for a living. And um, one of the areas I liked was, was uh, elliptic curves and number theory and, and sort of cryptography in a sense. Um, one of my friends, one of my closest friends put all of his money in Bitcoin. And I was like, all right, well, let me try to understand it the way I would understand a biotech. And when I look at a biotech, I really want to like dive in so close to like the point where like I can make the drug myself and I could like study it myself. And I, I cultivated that ability over 20 years of studying drugs, but I also know what it's like to start over. And I was like, you know, I'll start from the very basics. How does Bitcoin work? And eventually, you know, it was this really technical math question. Uh, and it centers around a mathematical object called an elliptic curve. Most of us don't spend too much time on mathematical objects. But a good example of a mathematical object is a group. And a group is just basically an abstract version of the things we normally do. Like when we were in grade school, we learn uh, about the integers. The integers are uh, a group. Um, and the definition of a group or a field or a ring or whatever is beyond the scope of what we care about right now. But studying the elliptic curve uh, or elliptic curves and learning that they are the main protection of Bitcoin uh, some people don't know this. They think it's SHA-256, which is a hashing function that is used in Bitcoin. But the, the main sort of like um, Achilles heel or like the main fortress, depending on how you look at it, of Bitcoin is, 
is this elliptic curve. Now, what is an elliptic curve? It's just a function. In this case, it's y squared. Pretty easy, right? We all went to grade school. y squared equals x cubed, still very easy, plus 7. That's it. Uh, now, there's more details than that, but that is the basic idea. And if you draw this on the, on a, at least on the reals, on the real numbers, you get a nice little ellipse. Um, depending on, on what it looks like, um, you can get this. It's kind of a more funky shape than that, but that's sort of where it comes from in terms of elliptic curve. It's actually not an ellipse, to be fair, but that's the idea. So this, this mathematical object uh, has interesting properties. It's a one-way function. So you can put an input in really easily and get this really elaborate output, but the output does not tell you what the input was. It's very hard to go from one to the other. It's very easy to go from one uh, to the other. So that's why Bitcoin is very hard to crack. I can't take your Bitcoin. I can't take Satoshi's Bitcoin, in fact. I can't take anyone's Bitcoin, unfortunately. Even if, even if I had 10 million NVIDIAs, I still couldn't do it. So I spent a lot of time working on this mathematical problem, principally because it's fairly interesting. Um, I learned a lot of math through it. I never had the fantasy that I'd figure it out. But, you know, I played with it just as a tool to learn my own, you know, learn math. And over time, what, you know, I became more, you know, facile at math and computer programming, which was fun. So I gained some muscles from it. Um, I married a young lady who, who works at OpenAI, and we, she's a, a math and computer expert herself. And we spent some time on it, and AI matured a little bit. And one of the interesting things about AI is that it seems to be getting better and better at, at mathematics, which is surprising because it's such a hard subject and it's kind of the height of intellectual achievement, in my opinion. Like for Maslow's theorem took 400 years of mathematical development to be solved. Riemann uh, and, and the Zeta conjecture still are not solved. That's been a few hundred years and they may never be solved. We don't know. So these the math puzzles last for years and years and years and uh, sometimes decades or centuries even, sometimes millennia. And to me, that's really cool. But AI is very smart too. And AI, AI is moving to be smarter and smarter and smarter all the time. So could we somehow use AI to make progress in math? And I think I'm not the only one who has this idea. Uh, Vlad Tenev has his little math AI startup. He was actually a mathematician uh, at Stanford. Um, OpenAI, of course, is working on some of this. Even Google's DeepMind has uh, an attempt to, to solve one of the most prestigious uh, math problems or the clay math, the clay millennial problems where clay put uh, some benefactor, he put a million dollars reward on each, on each problem. Elliptic curves are not part of the clay millennia prize. In fact, elliptic curves, I would say, are a trillion dollar prize. <laughs> so <laughs> Satoshi's money is guarded by the elliptic curves. So the question is, will we see an analytical solution, which is just a math solution, to the elliptic curve problem? And most people think the answer is no. I actually do think the answer is yes. I think that there is an analytical solution that is very easy to do. We just don't know how to do it. And we may not know for hundreds of years. But instead of hundreds of years of humans sitting down learning math, it could be a machine that does it with humans or without or whatever. So I don't know when that'll happen, but I'm fairly certain that within a few centuries or something, hopefully within six months, but unlikely, that you could actually just say, oh, your Bitcoin key, your public key is this, then your private key is that. And your private key is this, your public key is that. That takes one second on any machine. But the reverse is the hard part. And the reverse is basically thought to be impossible. Um, so maybe it'll be possible. We'll see. Now, the way you would do it um, is called Pollard's Row. And Pollard's Row is an interesting algorithm that does find you this answer. And it guarantees, in fact, that it'll find you the answer in around square root of n operations. Now, square root, again, simple math from high school. Uh, n is very, very big in Bitcoin. It's 2 to the 256th power. So square root of that is 2 to the 128th power which there are not enough NVIDIAs in the world that could do that. But my research has shown that it's not that far off. Um, it's still, you know, what most people would say too far off to even think about. But if you do the math very carefully and you assume there are some mathematical successes, not breakthroughs, mind you, but just incremental improvements, maybe it's possible with Moore's Law in around 10 years of progress, you may be able to see an analytical solution plus like a very high throughput computer solution, maybe. Now, before then, what most people think is gonna happen is a quantum computer will be able to break um, 
what specifically is sec p 256 k1 which will get start to get a little more technical here because it matters when it comes to btq and bitcoin and all this so sec p 256 k1 is pretty simple it's it's uh it's the elliptic curve specifically that protects bitcoin the p stands for prime 256 stands for 256 bits the k stands for koblitz it's a koblitz curve koblitz helped invent elliptic curves and that's it it's the sec p 256 k1 curve and it is the curve that protects bitcoin and ethereum actually um and satoshi didn't pick this curve too deliberately it was, seemed like almost like a random choice and i think the big mistake satoshi made was picking a 256 bit curve when he could have picked a 512 bit curve and there'd be no possibility of an analytic solution but by picking 256, I don't think he realized just how fast computers would get in 2008, where they'd be in 2025 or 2030. So I do think Bitcoin's vulnerable from just a pure classical analytical perspective. But of course, Bitcoin's also vulnerable from a quantum perspective. And say what you want about quantum, no matter what you think about quantum, you have to concede, even if you're the biggest bear in the world, you have to concede at some point there will be a quantum computer that can run Shor's algorithm. I think it's hard. I've not really met anybody who's credible in saying that'll never happen. You could argue it's 30 years away. You could argue it's 50 years away. Um, and, and those are probably aggressively long timelines, but you can't argue it's never gonna happen. And if Bitcoin is supposed to be what it's cracked up to be, it's supposed to be this hard money that lasts forever. It's like gold, right? And if that's true, well, 50 years from now, I don't know if I'm gonna be alive, hopefully, but somebody will be. And if it's still worth trillions, well, it's a big problem 50 years from now. Now, if it's 30 years from now, I'm pretty sure I'll be alive. And if it's 10 years from now, or if you listen to ION Q, it's one year from now. <laughs> I don't think anyone believes that one. Then, you know, Bitcoin's really cooked. And markets, you know, as we all know, they kind of discount the future very quickly and easily. So the Bitcoin price has not dropped. So Bitcoin market is telling you it's not coming anytime soon. Bitcoin doesn't seem to be worried about quantum. So what, what can quantum do and, and when will it hurt Bitcoin? Well, there's a lot to this, but the long story short is that you need, I don't know, at least, oh, geez, let me get the math right. You need a lot of qubits to, to run Shor's algorithm exactly on, on Bitcoin. I want to say that it's 3n cubed, uh, which is a you know, fairly big number indeed. It's uh, 2 million qubits. Um, it probably be, can be done with less. But regardless, um, if that's the number, or, or even if it's, you know, again, it could be wrong, let's say it's a thousand qubits, um, we're very, very far away from that. You know, we don't even really have one logical qubit, but, you know, maybe, maybe we can get it done in five or 10 years. Um, so what happens? Well, for Bitcoin at the very least, I think that you can fork it. Um, that's the good thing about software and the bad thing about software. The, the problem with forking it is two really big problems. The first is no one wants to do it. <laughs> the Bitcoin community hates, you know, the idea of forking anything. It's kind of like a, a really, really big thing. We want to keep it the way it is. Despite that, there have been a bunch of upgrades to Bitcoin. There have been like six of them. Um, and, you know, they, they've taken just fine. So I do think we can add a seventh. I don't think it's the end of the world. I'm in the middle of something, but, you know, let me, you know, Jack keeps waving his hand. I see your hand waving, but I'm, I'm literally in the middle of like a steep explanation of something. So why would you interrupt it? I don't know, but I'm not going to let you. Getting back to my point, Bitcoin is, is a, it, it's an upgrade that has to happen. And I think despite the hatred for changing the core code of Bitcoin, right now I'm just going to have to block you, Jack. It's really not that hard to be reasonable person is it i've removed you from the space for abusive behavior um anyway the uh the point i'm making is that uh if if they are forced to upgrade i think they'll upgrade it and i think that the second problem after like getting over that inertia is kind of this problem where what do you do with tokens that are now quantum vulnerable so if you say okay i have a new protocol Move your tokens to a new protocol and they'll be safe. Cool. Binance will do that. Robinhood will do that. Maybe you'll do that. Maybe I'll do that. But what do you do about Satoshi, who most people think is dead? What do you think? What do you do about his coins? Well, if you just leave them be, the first guy with a quantum computer 
grabs them and says, cool, those are mine now, and I'm going to move them to Quantum, where they're safely mine now. And you really can't do anything about it, because once the Quantum computer's out, everyone's private key is public. And that's terrible, because that means the whole system's flawed, it's worthless, nobody would use it. So you got to move everyone off. But if you stop the ability for old keys and old wallets and old addresses to move their tokens after a certain date, so let's say the quantum computer comes out and I take Satoshi's keys and I move it over, well, every Bitcoin that hasn't been moved over will effectively be stolen. And that's not something anybody wants. It would really hurt the value of Bitcoin. So you basically, the only way you could do this is you say there's a drop dead date. And folks have done this with the, the euro. There are many countries that said, you have to exchange your predecessor currency for the euro by this date. And some countries said they'll do it forever. And other countries said, no, by, by 2022 or 20, 2002, all Deutschmark are, are zeroed out unless you change them or whatever country did whatever policy. So I think that has to happen. And the problem with that is it'll work, but it'll only work for 20 years or whenever the next vulnerability is. So you have, this you have this super hard money. It turns out it wasn't that hard. And even gold, even gold, right, had, had uh, in the 70s with Bretton Woods, gold was illegal to own as an American. So, you know, money is not always so perfect. Um, and Bitcoin's several flaws here kind of demonstrate that. So in terms of moving to quantum security, I don't think you need BTQ. So here, here comes BTQ. It's a company that has put, let me just get this straight here. The whole company, since they started the company, $41 million has gone into it. Um, the company you know, um, has spent, I think since it existed, maybe five million in R&D, maybe. So that, that, num that number is probably stale. Um, maybe 10? Well, yeah, I mean, well, looping back to your points, just so, so I can comment on it real quick. Yeah. Couldn't agree more with kind of how you laid that out. I think part of what I wanted to relay as it relates to BTQ vis a vis, you know, the Vergettis, IMQs, et cetera, of the world is. Well, I don't compare them against well, anybody else, right? I mean, that's not my job. Right, right, right. right. And, and I know um, this might be more for others who, who are comparing. Um, less, less so well, I, I wouldn't. I wouldn't encourage them to compare it either. You know, it's it's just yeah. a company, right? Your, our job is to. Yeah. Our job is to value the company. What does the company Trump have? News alert: Putin Trump exactly. summit. It has nothing to do with after Russia rejects e -wave or anybody so, else. Exactly, and I can tell you from from my standpoint how I've been looking at valuing the company at least. Um, well, I thought you were going to you know, talk I, about what I talked about. view I, I actually similarly view it as you um, you know there's no way that I can you know tangibly give anyone a date where that situation occurs but I can tell you that the company itself like the, the, the actual revenue generation that we will see with the company is not going to stem from you know Bitcoin quantum nowhere in the next year to two years um, nothing material at least uh, where it will stem from is defense applications tied to CNSA 2.0 and the transition timelines that have been put forth there, which I think are actually tangible and being, you know, driven by regulation. Um, and then some of the stablecoin work that they're doing, which, again, is actually tangible. Um, but long story short, I do agree with a lot of the technicalities you put forth, and I think it's really wise to think through those. Um, I just think it's it's maybe a little too soon to you know call it a no brainer short when when I do believe we will see some pretty impressive contracts coming forward.